Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. Uh, my email address is mccormick at csus.edu. And this is my lecture on Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, chapters 10 through 18. Uh, this is the section of his book, I believe part two, about um, biases and heuristics. I'm going to have two lectures on this section of the book. So this is part one of those two lectures about chapters 10 through 18. All right, so here's the general project. Uh, Kenman said this in the intro. Why is it so difficult for us to think statistically? We easily think associatively. We think metaphorically. We think causally. But statistics require thinking about many things at once, which is something that System 1 is not designed to do. So part of what we're doing in this section of the book and what we're talking about in the course is that you've got this System 1, this very fast um, um, quick and dirty system for making uh, very important, sometimes very fast decisions at so that sometimes compromise accuracy for speed. Um, and it leads us astray very often, leads system two astray very often when we're trying to make good decisions. So we're going to take a deeper look now into the details of why is it how does, how does probabilistic reasoning work? How does, how does good statistical reasoning work versus how is it that the, um, the human cognitive system uh, draws its conclusions or makes its decisions in those kinds of situations where a good statistical uh, judgment would be better? Um, and the, in more detail, the conflict comes up because system one employs heuristics or biases. Um, and these are you know shorthand rules. These are quick... Um, ways to produce, you know, decent answers to uh, problems that you don't have enough time or resources or energy or cognitive um, <clears throat> resources to invest into. Um, so heuris heuristics and biases come up with fast, easy, low effort, generally effective solutions to de decisions, but they're often not or sometimes not statistically accurate. So we're going to look at the ways in which they go off the rails here. So he's got several topics in this section of the book. He's going to talk about the law of small numbers, uh, anchors, availability, availability bias, emotion and risk, stereotypes, representativeness and base rates, the conjunction fallacy, single and joint evaluations, causal stereotypes, statistics, regression to the mean, and taming intuitive predictions. This first part of the, of the uh, lecture is going to cover about half of those. Okay, so let's talk about the law of small numbers. Here's what happens. Um, this is just a fact about the world that when you take small samples, like your experience, your experience is a very small sample of the world, um, extreme outcomes, either high or low outcomes, are more likely to be found in small rather than large samples. So when your experience, when your anecdotes, um, when your <clears throat> the things you've encountered are limited in number, you know, um, if you've only been to a few places or you've, only, you've never left a little town in your life, then the world's going to look very different to you than if you lived in New York City all your life, right? Um, if you lived in a small town in the, in the South all your life and that was your sole experience, it's not going to be representative of the world. So it's going to have more extreme outcomes in terms of, I don't know, race or income or um, homogeneity or religion or, you know, you name it. You pick any sort of socio socioeconomic measure. Um, and suppose your experience is only a very small town. You're going to have a misrepresentative experience. But, but the error, the mistake is that we often take these small number um, experiences to be representative or indicative of what's going on in the world at large. So when we find these extremes in small samples, there may be nothing to be explained um, because some of this just happens at random, but our minds search for and jump to causal explanations for the why that doesn't exist. It must be a trend. It looks like there's something happening here in my, in my small experience and there must be a cause. So then we go off and we build up a causal story for it. And I'll show you a good example of how that works. So here's what Kahneman says, we ought to treat our statistical intuitions with proper suspicion and replace impression formation by computation wherever possible. So part of what we're learning in this course is how to do <clears throat> better probability judgments. And this, is, this discussion is going to help us understand um, the representativeness or the non-representativeness of our experience or some data set uh, for the whole at large. Um, and... Generally, the trend, and his some recommendation that 
Kahneman gives us that look doubt in these kinds of cases is hard because system one wants to give an answer and certainty feels easy. Um, we tend to polarize our answers either true or false and we jump to these conclusions without sort of uh, tolerating the ambiguity or tolerating the unknown of not having enough data. Okay, so let me talk about clumps and clusters and let me talk about randomness in the real world. So, <clears throat> as I said, statistical extremes are more likely to be found in small sample populations. Large populations or samples even the rates out when you start looking at larger numbers. Okay, so I'm going to explain the picture in just a second. That is, if I was to go randomly sample, you know, um, uh, 10 people uh, off the street or off campus at Sac State, uh, I might well very easily get some sort of what looks like to be a trend um, because I've got a small sample. I might get a lot. I might get all women. I might get all Hispanics. I might get all this, all that, um, because it's such a small sample. But it's less likely for that to happen as my sample, uh, my my uh, in information set gets bigger. Because as information gets bigger, my my sample gets bigger. Then it gets to gets more to the size and more to um, capturing more and more of all of the diversity of all the things in the larger population. <clears throat> so not only do we draw conclusions from these small numbers, but we also to readily construct causal explanations for this pseudo phenomena. And once you start seeing this happen, you'll see it everywhere. People are leaping to causal explanations all the time on the basis of no little or no information at all. Um, okay, so Kahneman gives this example. Um, look, we know that the highest and the lowest rates of kidney cancer occur in rural, sparsely populated counties. And what happens when you, you show those separately, those two results to people, um, they will cause it, they will fabricate causal stories for both. They'll say, oh, well, it must be the clean rural living that leads to lower cancer rates. Or if it's a high cancer, kidney cancer rate um, area, they'll say, oh, well, it's less access to health care leads to higher cancer in rural areas. So imagine that um, we've got these two samples, like A and B, in a real random situation. And in A, it looks like something's happening, there's a cluster. And in B, it looks like nothing's happening, there's nothing there. So we find ourselves, we may find ourselves within one of those two experiences, and we start building a causal story about it. When were you to zoom out, you wouldn't find anything to explain at all, because the larger sampling of real randomness um, evens things out, and it turns out there's nothing there to be explained after all. <clears throat> okay, so what's going on here is that our intuitive expectations about what randomness is tend to be off the mark. We tend to think of randomness as being kind of homogenous and uniformly spread out, like my picture of dots on the right. So we think of randomness as, as, as well, look, if I'm flipping a coin, then if, I'm, if I flip it 10 times, I ought to get you know this distribution of 50 heads, five heads and five tails, and anything very far off of that strikes us as not random. Well, actually, it's quite common to get you know a big string of heads or a big string of tails in 10 flips of the coin. Were I to flip the coin 100 times, it's very unlikely that I'm going to get all heads. So that's what I mean by larger sampling actually evens out what appears to be um, some sort of phenomena. And it's because we think of randomness as being different than it actually is. Randomness has clumps and clusters. It bunches up in places and it and it spreads out and it uh, goes it's gappy in places and it's not because there's any particular causal uh, force at work or some causal explanation. It's just that's the way things um, fall. That's just the way things randomly distribute in the world. So in the left uh, pattern of dots is more like a real uh, actual random distribution. Um, so what happens is that first I notice something in my local experience, like suppose I'm A or suppose I'm in the B uh, local cluster, and I think, oh, I noticed something. There's something going on here. There's something happening. It must be a trend. Either it's an empty trend for B or it's a very busy trend for A. Oh, there's lots of cancer here or there's no cancer here. And then second, we jump to the conclusion there must be some causal explanation for it. So um, the, the mistake is thinking that your small, and the law of small numbers here that uh, Kim's getting at is that is the mistake is you're thinking that your small sample is representative of some trend at the larger uh, zoomed out level. 
Okay, so the problem now here, and I'm going to add this, this is a point to add on the side of Kahneman, is that there are billions of, there's billions of dollars being made off you making this mistake. I just can't, I can't even enumerate the number of cases where uh, somebody clever has figured out how to capitalize on people making this mistake. And here's what happens. Um, you find yourself either in situation A or situation B just through random chance, just because that's the way the cookie crumbles in the world and things get distributed. So sometimes there's a gap and sometimes there's a busy cluster you're in. Um, so maybe you have <clears throat> several days of a dry skin condition, or maybe there's a cluster of bad social encounters. You have a bunch of bad days, or you have a dry dating spell, um, or you've got a fussy baby that's unhappy for a few days, or you're feeling sick. Okay, so there's first the phenomena that you think is some phenomena that needs to be explained. So you go out on the basis of your causal expectation. There's got to be something here to fix it. Um, address the problem. So you buy some poorly regulated remedy online or at the health food store or you buy a health food, you buy a self-help book or you read your astrology forecast or whatever. Like I can go on and on about the list where people think they're seeing some phenomena that needs a causal explanation. And I like picking on Airborne here because Airborne, uh, the Airborne company has made billions of dollars just by themselves on this phenomena where people, you know, feel a little sick, feel like they got a cold coming on, and then they uh, they go by airborne, which has been studied, and it, it does no has no causal impact on colds whatsoever. It does not um, help your immune system. It doesn't cure colds. Um, in fact, they got in trouble for saying at one point that um, airborne prevented colds. They actually said it on the box, and there was a class action lawsuit against them, and they lost the suit. They had to pay billions of dollars out to the class action suit, and they had to change the label. The only way they get away with the label saying helps support your immune system and you'll see the little asterisks on that um, label right there is that the FDA has uh, some regulations about what constitutes a medical treatment versus what constitutes a dietary supplement. Airborne is produced and distributed under dietary supplements and there's rules about how strong a medical claim you can make about a dietary supplement and so far you can sort of get away with saying something vague like help support your immune system but if you go actually go and look what that asterisk stands for is on the back there's a disclaimer that says the FDA has not examined or seen evidence to support this claim this product is not intended to treat cure or prevent illness in any form. So there's actually, and it's very small print, you need a magnifying, magnifying glass to see it um, on the back. Um, so it turns out that it, even that claim is not, not well supported, but they're getting away with it because no one's forced them to take that off through a lawsuit. So what happens is that the situation shifts, which it was going to do anyway. You might have gotten over your cold, or your baby would have stopped fussing, or your skin would have cleared up, or you would have had a better date, or whatever. So the situation shifts because it naturally will, because randomness um, is random and things move back and forth. And we're going to talk soon about regression to the mean in this section of Kahneman's book. And that'll explain that concept of shifting back on its own naturally. And then you credit the remedy or the self-help book or the app or the holistic cure or your astrology forecast or whatever for curing the situation or fixing the problem. So now you're out your nine bucks for your airborne or you're paying $20 a, a month for your astrology forecast um, for your astrology app or whatever. There's um, you know a long list of these. I go through a bunch of them in my critical thinking class. Uh, there's, there's no end of people out there who are willing to make money off of your uh, need to uh, make a hasty causal conclusion and then go try to fix something that actually doesn't need to be fixed or there's nothing going wrong. All right, so just uh, uh, I've got a gripe about airborne in every lecture. Okay, so uh, here's Kahneman's example. Which of these sequences of babies in the hospital is more probable? And this is to put you down into one of those little local experiences and ask about randomness. So suppose you're working in a maternity ward in a hospital and you have six boys in a row. Is that more probable or is this sequence more probable? You have two girls, a boy, a girl, a boy, a girl. Okay, it's very hard to look at that especially if you were a nurse who came in on the first day and saw that string of boys and you'd notice that that's a pattern that's something that would jump out at you you'd go wow what's going on it's all boys today but um, and it seems like the more probable more likely outcome would be this kind of random distribution okay that's you having a faulty notion of randomness because randomness does bunch up in clusters like this 
um, it need not always be distributed like this, sort of homogeneously and evenly, like in my picture in the previous slide. Intuitively, the second uh, sequence seems more likely, and we think that's the way things normally need to go, but they're both equally likely or unlikely. If you do the odds on these, 50-50 chance, actually slightly greater chance of girls being born, 50-50 chance of each one of these children being born, and the odds are exactly the same. And look, I mean, think about it this way. When you get to this last boy in the, the this last boy baby, baby, so there were six couples that came in the maternity ward that day, and they all had their babies. Is there any causal connection between the sixth couple and their boy baby and the previous boys? No, they're just all random couples that came from the neighborhood, came from the, came from the city or whatever. Um, there's no connection between these are in terms of our earlier semester or in our earlier lecture. These are independent events. Um, the birth and the the gender of this boy is uh, statistically probabilistically independent from the the gender of this boy, and likewise for these ones. The next baby in the ward has no causal connection to the previous one. Okay, the same goes for stockbrokers who claim to be able to pick stocks. It goes for your experience with the COVID vaccine where you maybe you, you felt funny or you felt bad and you think it has bad side effects. Um, a basketball player who has a hot hand streak um, for homeopathic remedies, for CBD oil, for all kinds of things. Um, now, I don't mean to discount that uh, we do know, for instance, that COVID vaccines do have some side effects associated with them. Um, but your expectation or your trying to find the causal uh, account of what's going on in your local phenomena can very often lead you to believe that something's going on that's not. It's it's that you have these false positives about some causal some causes present that's producing the effects that I'm witnessing. All of these are samples where probably the anecdotal personal local experience of the person involved is too small to draw any sweeping causal conclusion on. In fact, Kahneman later in the book is going to go off on stockbrokers uh, because it turns out. Um, and another, there's another author here, Philip Tetlock, who showed famously that um, lots of these so-called expert stockbrokers do no better than dart throwing monkeys at picking winning stocks, yet they insist on claiming they've got all this skill and they've got all this ability of picking stocks and they'll tell you a causal story about why this stock is going up and why that was going down. And it's all bullshit. It's all uh, fabricated from this um, sort of misperception of, of local versus um, random events in the larger picture. System one has exaggerated faith in small samples is the way that Kahneman summarizes the point. Okay, next issue. So that's the law of small numbers. The next issue is anchoring, and this is going to be familiar to you. Uh, when a number or an idea is present in the environment or context, the human cognitive system latches onto it and it affects the results of decision making. Okay, that, and that's vague, but you'll see this immediately. Um, do you know what an SM, uh, MSRP is? A manufactured suggested retail price. So over here on these car ads, um, the MSRP is listed, for instance, this Jetta, um, these Volkswagens, it's listed as 25885 MSRP. It's been crossed out. And then the car is listed at 18885 And then they claim, oh, you're saving $7,000. Okay, so somebody goes, oh, I'm saving a lot of money because this was $25,000 and now it's only $18,000. Well, look, that the, both, of, both of those numbers were picked by the car dealership and by the car company. Then they, and they can set that number anything they want. They can call it $50,000 and then sell it to you for $18,000. And you think, oh, I just saved $32,000. The MSRP is an anchor. It's a number that's put out there that doesn't mean anything, that they deliberately inflate it to make it seem like, and then they undercut it to make it feel like, oh, I'm getting a good deal. Same thing for, it turns out, when Safeway or Rayleigh's does this four for five dollars, um, or when Safeway does it, <clears throat> you know, you get tomato sauce, 10 cans for ten dollars. Well, I checked at Safeway, and they will give you one can for one dollar. Um, that's always the deal on these, you know, X for such and such money deals when they have these ads. Uh, but what happens is that people don't do that. They will, suppose I, I go to the store, I only need three cans of tomato sauce. Well, I see the sign 10 for $10 and I'm more inclined, I'm anchored, I'm pulled up towards that 10 and I'm more inclined to buy 10. Uh, so actually what happens is that the number of people buying 10 cans of tomato sauce shoots up as soon as Safeway puts this ad out.
Um, and what they're doing is they're artificially inflating sales by making you feel like, oh, well, I've got to have 10 or, I, or 10 is the number that we need or I'm anchored at 10 or I get pulled up to 10. The same thing happens for a listing price on a home. You can say, oh, price reduced for quick sale. Again, same as a, the other point that the numbers here are anchoring you and they're pulling you in to make you feel like you, you need to buy more. You think you're getting the good deal. You should spend more. They make you overestimate the value of the home or whatever. There's a lot of really good examples that Kahneman gives in his chapter. He says, any number that you are asked to consider as a possible solution to an estimation problem will induce an anchoring effect. So be careful here, right? Anytime somebody plants a number in your head, they could be doing this to you. I actually used this to, for evil a few years ago. I was getting my house appraised um, so that I could get it refinanced at a, for a new loan at a lower interest rate. And I needed... <clears throat> the appraiser to value the house at a certain amount so that I could get this qualify for this loan. So in the process of talking to this appraiser and looking at the house, I pointed out all the things I'd done to it and all that, and I mentioned the number. I gave him the number. Um, I put the number in his head because I knew about this anchoring effect and putting the number in his head, sure enough, he came in um, over the number I needed and it let me get the loan that I needed. So you can use it uh, for your advantage and for evil too on the other side. But watch out for people doing it to you. Kahneman um, gives this example about soup. Um, they did a study in a supermarket where um, uh, the, the soup is on sale. It's 10% off on sale, but they put a limit on the sign. It says limit of 12 per person. People buy, then buy seven cans on average. They tend to buy closer to 12 uh, cans because they have this feeling like, oh, well, that's the upper limit of how many you can buy. But if they run the same deal, they run the soup at 10% off, but they don't put the limit of 12, 12 cans per person, then people buy half as many cans. So putting that 12 on there, and especially saying limit, right? Oh, well, you can't limit me, or I'm gonna, I better stock up on these because it's limited and I can't get, get enough of it. Um, just putting that limit out there and putting that number 12 makes me buy more, leads people on average to get more. That's how anchoring is pulling you around all day long uh, on your buying decisions. And the same goes for you selling something on Craigslist. If you set a high asking price, that's going to set expectations. It gets the buyer thinking about that number. So maybe you should set it extra high. And then when you negotiate, come down to the number you really want. Maybe you should think about the number you really want for the thing you're selling, your bike or your car or your rental price or whatever. Uh, think about the number you actually want and then set the asking price um, or the anchoring price much higher and see if you can get more. Um, same should go for job negotiations where you put a crazy number out there for what salary you want. And then if you're expecting, if you'd be happy with less, then when the, the, the boss comes in at less, it'll come in anchored and pulled up towards that higher number, you hope. Same goes for personal injury cases. Defendants and lawyers um, set an outrageously high amount that fixes expectations with the jury. So then it pulls them and their expectation up and ends up giving bigger rewards and so on. Um, okay, so next phenomena uh, after anchoring in this portion of the book has to do with ease and availability, representativeness, and frequency. So um, here's the idea. We make intuitive judgments about frequency and probability by reference to the ease with which instances of the class come to mind. Okay, so what does it mean to say that you make a judgment, a judgment about frequency or probability? Well, if I ask you something like, um, what uh, proportion of the population is gay? Or what proportion of the population is African American? Or what proportion of the population is over 70? Um, anything like that, right? Where I'm asking you to make a intuitive frequency judgment. Um, what Kahneman's saying here is that you will, your answer here will be affected by how easy is it for you to be able to come up with examples. If you can come up with lots of examples readily and easily, then your estimation of the frequency will be high. And if you struggle to come up with examples, your estimation of the frequency will be low. So ease, gets, um, ease and availability gets substituted in for actual frequency. Uh, okay, so is it probable becomes, is it easy to think of examples? And if I can think of examples, then I go, yes, it's probable. Uh, for example, do Hollywood couples get divorced at a higher rate than regular couples? 
Well, I don't know. If you watch any of the tabloid news or you read up on this stuff, you can probably quite easily come up with examples of Hollywood couples who are getting divorced. And it might be easier to come up with those examples than um, examples of regular couples because you don't know that many regular couples, but there's lots of famous Hollywood couples. Um, but I suspect that the divorce rates may be just the same. Or I'd be, because uh, because Kahneman's trained me well, I'm reluctant to go with my intuition that Hollywood couples have a higher divorce rate than other couples. Although you might still feel that, that, that that's true. Do politicians get into more sex scandals than other people? Now, my intuition about this is that it's true. Um, but again, uh, this has to do with news and availability and these vivid examples that get on the news that make the Washington Post or whatever, um, that when a politician gets into a sex scandal, it becomes a you know national uh, national news and everybody talks about it, everybody finds out about it. But if somebody down the street gets into a sex scandal, you don't hear about it. So you've just got a sampling problem here. you just got an availability. You've got a representativeness problem with your experience versus the real frequency. Um, is crime in your neighborhood bad, or is it worse than it used to be? And especially after you've recently experienced some, you're going to estimate that really high. Um, and this is an example that Kahneman uses. Are there more words in English that start with the letter K, or that have K as the third letter? And the thing is, I can really quickly and easily come up with a long list of words that have K as the first letter. But K as a third letter is kind of awkward and hard to find, or hard to think of cases. So I would estimate, just by my ease and availability, I would estimate that the first letter K words are more common or a higher probability, but actually the third letter K words are more common. So your ease and availability is actually contrary to the real frequency in the world. Okay, so more examples, make it really clear. How common are mass shootings? Um, or how risky are they? Or how bad are they? They're really bad. We see them all the time. There's one on the news just the other day. How likely are you to be the victim of gun violence? A lot of people worried about that. How common are terrorist attacks? That will tick up and down depending on what's happening in the news. Is violence on the whole on the rise or on the decline? Most people feel like it's on the rise. And again, this has to do with ease and ease of recall and availability, not with real frequency. Those are actually all on the decline. How dangerous is parachuting? I can easily and readily come up with examples of that going wrong. How often do people die from asthma? Pretty hard for me to imagine any cases like that, so I estimate that really low. Um, who did the most work in the last group project you were in, right? You were in a class, in one of your classes, you got put in a group project, and you came away feeling like, I did way more work than everybody else in this group. I was the hard worker there, and they all wrote on my coattails. And I guarantee there's some other people in the group who feel the very same way. And the, the trick is trying to reconcile, how do, how do you all feel that way? That can't be right. Um, and the bigger point here is that if it's easy, uh, the fact that it's easy to come to mind does not equal that it's probable. Ease and availability are not the same thing as probable or frequent. Um, and here's some advice. Uh, it turns out that what couples fight about, and here's some fantastic advice from Kahneman, couples will fight about four things. Here's all four of them. They'll fight about money, and they will both think this question. How much money have I contributed to our joint expenses? Versus, how much money has my partner contributed to our joint expenses? Now, the first are very easy to come by. You remember those? They're vivid. They're very available to you. You can remember all of the specific instances where you contributed money. But the times when they did are harder to come by, harder to remember, um, not so fresh in your mind. So it seems to you that there's an imbalance in the contribution of money. Well, I guarantee that your partner, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, um, they feel the same way. They're having the, the uh, flipped experience because they can't remember your contributions as well as they can remember their own. And the same goes for chores. How often do I take out the garbage, do the dishes, make the bed versus how often does my partner? Well, I don't know about, see about, think about, remember all the cases where my partner does it, but I do remember all the cases when I do it because I did it. So I have this skewed uh, idea about how often it happens. Free time, how often does my partner leave me alone to go do something with someone else without me versus how often do I leave my partner alone and go do something without, uh, with someone else without my partner? Uh, so the, here's the four things, right? Uh, money, chores, free time, and sex. That's what people argue about in relationships. And they invariably have this skewed view where both of them think that they're doing more or giving more or contributing more than the other one is. And the fight tends to be about that discrepancy. How often does he do something nice or intimate for me? How often does she initiate sex and so on? That's what people fight about. So were you to zoom out 
Um, if we want to resolve these fights, that depends on both, both of you taking the outside view that more accurately tracks both sides. If you could zoom out and keep track in a way that doesn't distort according to your memory, your uh, experience, and doesn't, you know, create this availability bias, then you'd have a better picture and you'd have fewer fights about money, chores, free time, sex, and all that. You'd have a better relationship if you could take the third uh, person perspective on the outside. So again, availability does not equal frequency, says Kahneman. Now, what's going on in these cases? Well, um, very often what happens in risk cases um, is that people, people's risk assessments, because of availability bias, are distorted by the sampling bias or by non-representative sampling. So let me see, explain what I mean. Risk equals probability times harm. That's one way to think about it. Like, if you're wondering about how risky it is is it to go outside in a lightning storm? Um, well, there's the probability you'll be struck by lightning, which is higher during a, during a lightning storm. And then there's the harm of being struck by lightning, which is pretty bad. It's, you know, ranges from, you know, going to the hospital to being dead. So the harm's bad and the probability's high, so it's pretty high risk. Whereas, um, you know, um, driving your car the speed limit on the highway, uh, pretty low probability you'll be an accident. And if you've got side airbags and a seatbelt on, pretty low risk of harm. Um, so that's how risk, that's what risk is. In many cases, our estimation of both of these are distorted by your anecdotal experience, your emotions, and non-representative sampling in this sort of clump and cluster way I've been talking about. So uh, there's an example of an ear doctor who was on NPR one day. I heard him talking about it. And the ear doctor had nothing but bad things to say about ever putting anything in your ear. He said categorically, never, ever put anything whatsoever in your ear. Well, I thought, surely that's an overstatement, right? I mean, it's got to be okay. I mean, a Q-tip or something, really? And then I realized, oh, well, he's an ear doctor. So what does he see all day? He sees... Um, foreign objects in ear disasters all day, every day. That's all he ever sees. He's got a sampling bias. Um, he never sees that go well because all of the examples he, he observes are ones where something really horrible happened and you needed a doctor to fix it. The same goes for the police who say, you know, don't do recreational drugs um, or Nancy Reagan back in the 90s. Or somebody who says, I'd never trust a self-driving car to drive better than I can. Or I had an aunt who used to say, don't go swimming for 30 minutes after you eat. Um, they're, they're getting these distorted ideas about risk, about how likely something is to happen and how bad the harm is. Um, or don't fly on 9-11. There's lots of other examples where people are inflating probabilities or they're inflating um, the harms stated. Uh, and that has to do very often about emotion. Um, and availability. So Kahneman cites some, some research here that talks about it. Um, it turns out that strokes cause almost twice as many deaths as all accidents combined, but 80% of the respondents in these polls judged that accidental death to be more likely. That is to say, people are more afraid of accidental death, even though strokes are far and away way more common. That's the way that people go out. Um, likewise, tornadoes are seen as more frequent killers rather than asthma, even though the latter causes death 20 times more often. Um, now, what's going on here? Well, tornado imagery is vivid and lurid and scary, and it's on the news. Um, it's very, it, gets, it gets our attention. It's very dramatic. Um, when you see footage of a tornado ripping through some little town in the Midwest, you can't forget it. But you can't recall ever seeing, um, you know, some case about uh, or some study or some report on the news about asthma rates going up, ticking up in California, right? That's not newsworthy. It's not lurid. It's not vivid. It doesn't. It's not available. It's not one of those tip of your tongue kinds of vivid images. The way um, K first words with K letters words with the first letter K versus words with the third letter K. Death by lightning was judged by people to be less likely than death from botulism, even though botulism is way more common, 52 times more frequent. Death by disease is 18 times as likely as accidental death, but the two were judged to be equal. So people are all over the map on this, and they're really bad at assessing um, actual risk, and it has to do with sort of the emotional impact of some of these harms versus others. Death by accidents was judged 300 times more likely than death by diabetes, but the true ratio is one to four. Like diabetes is really, really common, but people, what people are worried about are accidents. That's what they think is going to get them. And of course, terrorism, terrorism, terrorism is the problem here. Everybody's always panicked about terrorism, which is astronomically unlikely. Um, here's another example I like. 
Uh, what about cousin marriage? You know, if you find out about cousins getting married, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, most Americans are very grossed out by that idea. What happens when first cousins marry and have babies? And everybody, the very first thing comes to mind is, oh, that's birth defects. That's that's awful. You can't do that. Um, you shouldn't do that. Cousins shouldn't get married. That's going to produce babies of birth, birth defects. Turns out the rate of birth defects is only slightly higher than it is for unrelated couples. It's very low birth defects for cousin marriage. And how about this? How high is the birth defect rate for women having babies past the age of 45? Most people don't worry about that. Turns out that's more dangerous. It's much higher than cousin marriage babies. Um, just the risk for Down syndrome is 3%, not counting other possible defects. We don't have that kind of aversive reaction to an older woman having a baby, but cousin marriage is very vivid and lurid and tawdry and sort of um, gross and evokes this emotional reaction. Okay, so there's a phenomena here that I call risk inversion. This is not in Kahneman. Uh, this is, I've got a lecture on this, and it's an idea that I've been trying to sort of communicate in my classes. Um, risk inversion is caused by availability, emotion, and non-representative sampling. Well, what is it? I'll give you some examples. Um, deaths per year by skydiving. Turns out that number is about seven per million. Um, Scott, we, we judge subjectively, emotionally, we judge skydiving to be really risky. Well, it turns out deaths per year by skiing is eight times higher, 54 per million. Skiing's way more dangerous than skydiving, which probably runs counter to your intuitions. Um, and years ago, I had a, a, a funny case. Uh, there had been a, a, a small cluster of murders in Yosemite that that year worked out to be about one per million. And it was all in the news, and everybody was talking about it, and they had this murderer on trial. And one of my students said, oh, well, I'm not going back to Yosemite. So I went and checked about the murder rate in Sacramento, and the murder rate in Sacramento is 70 per million. So I went back to her the next day and said, no, you need to pack up your car and go to Yosemite right now. You can't possibly stay in Elk Grove. It's way more dangerous than Yosemite. Um, so we get these really skewed ideas about what's dangerous and what's not. Terrorism, uh, the instances of being a victim of terrorism are 0.29 per million people, whereas potato salad kills 20 people per million people, which makes it 70 times more dangerous. Never get any lurid, vivid video on the evening news about potato salad killing people, but lots of news about terrorism, and people have those risks totally inverted in their heads, and they have those risks, uh, you know, reversed. So see my risk inversion lecture. It's on my YouTube page. It's connected to our class for a journal assignment. For more details, I explain that in much more detail there. And the idea is risk inversion is the mistake of accepting a high risk for one activity while rejecting another activity with a much lower risk. And risk equals probability times harm. Risk inverters often overestimate both because of avail availability, the law of small numbers, emotion, non-representative sampling, and so on. So that fits very nicely with Cannon's lecture here. Uh, okay, let's talk about uh, availability cascades. Um, Kahneman has a few pages to talk about this. Look, when the media gets a hold of these kinds of cases, and this is why we have these distorted pictures of risk, media reports disproportionately represent lurid, vivid, violent, frightening possibilities resulting in a biased data set. So if you look at this chart right here, here's victims of violent crime and property crime from the year, um, from back in the 90s to the year 2016. So you'll see on these two lines that property crime and violent crime are steadily going down. But on this chart, you can see, especially after 2001, so that would have been 9-11, that fear of crime, a fear of U.S. crime has steadily gone up despite the actual data. So right there, that's um, one of these availability bias mistakes, that the actual numbers are going down, here's the inversion, and, and the people's fear of crime is going up. Likewise, here's people's uh, chart mapping people's fear of terrorism. So it peaks right after 2001, after 9-11, and it goes up and down, up and down around the elections and steadily goes up. So we're still at a very high number. People are still very afraid of terrorism, even though it's orders of magnitude less likely to happen to you than a whole bunch of other things that you never worry about at all. Okay, that's partly because of news reporting. Frightening, vivid thoughts and images occur to us with particular ease, and that feeds availability bias. Thoughts of danger that are fluent and vivid exacerbate fear, and fear beats hope. There's a heavy negativity bias that evolution has built us in to worry more about things that are dangerous than worry about things or think about things that are hopeful. And then uh, Kahneman calls it an availability cascade. He calls this a self-sustaining chain of events 
which may start from media reports of a relatively minor event and lead up to a public panic and large-scale government action. On some occasions, a media story about a risk catches the attention of a segment of the public, which becomes aroused and worried. This emotional reaction becomes a story in itself, prompting additional coverage in the media, which in turn produces greater concern and involvement, and the thing just feeds itself and snowballs out of control. And I've been teaching this, talking about this phenomenon for semesters now, and every semester there's a different one of these going on in the news. So I've got a very long list. Right now everybody's um, out taking ivermectin to try to cure COVID, which it doesn't do. Or they were worried about terrorism. Or remember Zika virus? Remember the West, Vilenar, uh, West Nile virus? Um, the safety of vaccines, violent video games, explicit rock and rap music. Like you can just go on and on and on about these examples of these availability cascades where worry and then news reports about the worry and then worry feed this um, snowballing effect that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And instead of making people stop worrying about it, Instead of learning when they find out the news that terrorism is exceedingly unlikely, just talking about it makes them worry about it more. Uh, okay, how do we fix it? Kahneman says, when estimating frequency, list the factors other than frequency that make it easy to come up with misrepresentative instances. A salient event that attracts your attention will be easily retrieved from memory like an ear doctor remembering an ear object disaster. A dramatic event temporarily increases the availability of its category. That's why I can think of all these ivermectin cases from the news this week. Personal experiences, pictures, and vivid examples are more available than incidents that happen to others, or mere words or statistics. And you, might, you need to wonder, are there aspects about my situation that are making X appear more frequent than it actually is? Am I like the ear doctor who only sees disasters with foreign objects in people's ears? Or here's another good example, the emergency room nurse who only sees drug use disasters, right? If you ask a cop or ask an emergency room nurse about, you know, recreational drug use, well, what are they going to tell you? The only kinds of cases they've ever seen, because they're like a they're like a funnel, they're at the bottom of a funnel that catches all of the disasters. So what are they going to tell you? Oh no, taking drugs is disastrous. And I'm, I won't make a claim about whether you should take drugs or not. I'm just making a point about how your picture of uh, your, your estimation about the frequency of something in the world gets distorted by this ease or availability or your situation and gives you a false picture. So you need to wonder how or where can I get representative sampling that's not distorted by these facts about my situation or by the news media or by my emotions or by my inability to remember words that have K as a third letter or what have you, right? Those are all sort of organic facts about me. They have nothing to do with the real rates in the world. Okay, so we've talked about the law of small numbers. Extreme outcomes, both high and low, are more likely to be found in small samples. Our experience is small, anecdotal, and not representative. And then we generate eager causal explanations for random clumps and clusters. That's the that first segment of this discussion. We've talked about the anchoring effect and the way the numbers will, um, you know, a number in your environment will affect the, uh, your estimation and you're trying, to pro uh, you're trying to make decisions and pull you to buy more money, spend more money, estimate wrong numbers. And availability bias, um, we make intuitive judgments of frequency and probability by reference to the ease with which instances of the class come to mind, but frequency or probability do not equal um, easy to recall. They're different things that need to be separated in our heads. All right, next we'll do the second part of this lecture about Kahneman 10 through 8.